Greetings to you. My name is Tara Brabazon and I'm the Dean of Graduate Research at Flinders University and welcome to vlog 212, comma, comma. And yeah, we're in for a ride today. Let me tell you what we're doing here. This vlog, comma, is our setup vlog, a setup vlog for the 10 sessions that are to follow. So it's a transitional moment from our writing series, and thank you for the great suggestions and the great feedback, you've been terrific, but it's a transition from our writing series to our new series. And yes, this new series will be confronting for you. It is challenging, it will require reflection, it will require some self-examination from you. And look, it's going to make us all <laughs> A little bit uncomfortable because it's asking that you think about yourself and yourself in context in the context of your peers your colleagues your discipline the university your past your present and yes the future now if you are going to finish a PhD if you are going to finish a PhD in tough times then you've got to look in the mirror and let me tell you how we got to this series and we got to the comma session today. There's nothing like a crisis <laughs> to create really bad behaviour. So the people that normally send well dodgy emails start in tough times to send emails that make you want to speed dial a lawyer. <laughs> that nasty bird, you know those nasty birds that always act like sort of that trendy girl in high school. You know about 13, those girls like, mm, they like you, you ugly, you ugly. You know those girls that become women? Well, that trendy person that was such a pain in high school has now reached such a point in your life that you're about to either put their head in a toilet or indeed your own. And the oversharers on Facebook who <laughs> normally just take pictures of their food, which is irritating enough, but right now in this moment of crisis, they appear to be taking lots of pictures of their medicine cabinets and informing you of the meds that they're taking each day. And yes, your friend who's always had some challenges with personal hygiene <laughs> has now completely jumped the shark and smells a lot like a third day at Woodstock. Yeah. So this isn't going too well. If you are a human, let alone if you are a human writing a PhD, there's always going to be a group of people around you who explain in torturous detail how messed up their lives are, how torturous their relationship is with their boyfriend, their girlfriend, their significant other, how much they despise their supervisor, how much their parents and their friends just don't understand them, how their research design is stuffed, how they can't find the stuff that they need, and basically their PhD is a complete train wreck. And of course, they explain to you in intricate detail on a daily basis how their research is actually over. And they're going to quit this PhD. I'm out. I'm out. They're going to quit this PhD tomorrow. And then, of course, you ask them tomorrow, so have you, have you quit the PhD? Oh, no, no, but I will tomorrow. And this goes on and on and on. Sound familiar? Yeah. So... In a PhD program, we are invariably surrounded by people who are bitter, angry, blaming every person on planet Earth that is still gulping oxygen, every sample that was once alive, and indeed they're bl blaming various inanimate objects for being an inanimate object. So we all know, I think, that a negativity that is shared is a negativity that is magnified. And yes, I think this lockdown, shutdown, complicated time is bringing out some of the worst in humanity. But whatever sad, tragic events happen in our lives, we see some similar cycles. So yes, there's all the stuff at the moment about the virus, but actually all bad stuff that happens in our lives. So 
unemployment, underemployment, the economy, the death of a significant person in our lives, the breakup of a friendship, the loss of a job, homelessness, all these types of systemic structural fears, if not realities, create this sense of catastrophe, not necessarily a catastrophe, but a sense of a catastrophe that yes, we're all ending, we're in the end game. And of course, these people are oversharing their fear, their worry, and their anxiety. And they're making it pretty toxic for the rest of us. So can I say, this is not unusual. That's why today is quite interesting, because in some ways the virus has triggered this environment, but this configures a lot about the normality of higher education more generally. Because this context exists in research and universities most of the time. Because there is a truth in academic life <laughs> that if it is possible to blame another person for your errors, <laughs> then yes, you will do that. So you hear academics do this on a daily basis. So when in doubt, let's blame the administrators. Oh, administrators. So yes, let's blame the most lowly paid people at a university who exist to try and support you and students. Yes, let's blame the administrators. Or let's blame the vice chancellor because he clearly knows exactly what I'm doing in my classroom every day. Let's blame my mother. Let's blame your mother. Let's blame your father. Let's blame that bloke that dumped you at 15. <laughs> let's do all of that. And of course, this toxic personal narrative builds up in your research life and culture. And how we see that manifest is through a series of proxies. Jealousy, bullying, narcissism, and of course, anger. So as I was watching all this bad stuff happening around me on the planet, and all of that's been intensified, of course, by the coronavirus. There's been all sorts of weaknesses and softness in our economy and culture more generally for a long time, for decades. So this stuff has pretty well always existed, but it's being intensified at the moment. I wanted to come up with, with something, not positive, but a strategy to move us forward. A symbol, if you will. Something that will help us understand this time, understand the present, but also transcend it, move beyond it. And I realised that what's occurring is that students are displacing this personal catastrophe onto the students around them, their friends, their family, their supervisor. And they're doing that by reading this present moment as a full stop. So in this present, right now, right now, okay, it's a catastrophe, this research, my life, my PhD has ended. So they're imagining that their life that they configured, they imagined, is over. And when I was pondering all of this and how we create a space out of this catastrophe, I remembered another great cultural moment that reminded people, reminds all of us, that at the worst moment of our lives, there is another path, there is another way. And that this dreadful moment is not a full stop. Now this movement that I want to talk about today is exemplified by the title Project Semicolon. Some of you may have heard of it, Project Semicolon. And this project is captured really by a tattoo of, as you can imagine, a semicolon. So that tattoo, often on the arm or wrist, sometimes on the hand, is a way to share and create an affirmative space, a space of solidarity for people who are considering suicide, certainly, but are also managing depression and anxiety begun in 2013 by Amy Bluhl, she wanted to acknowledge her personal struggle with depression and addiction. Her father committed suicide and she decided that the semicolon was the right symbol for her actions 
and her beliefs. She believed this symbol is, quote, used when an author could have chosen to end their sentence, but chose not to. The author is you, and the sentence is your life. End of quote. This is profound, and this profoundly successful project attempts every day to prevent suicide, to create strategies to support mental health. So this semicolon tattoo is used to express, yes, personal survival, but also solidarity. It is a sign of hope. It is a sign of inspiration. This project, of course, gained a lot of further profile. Maybe where you've heard of it is from that 2017 Netflix series, 13 Reasons Why, based on the Jay Asher novel. And there is, I think, a tragedy that we have to acknowledge before we enter uh, how I'm going to use this work today in the vlog. There is a tragedy to this narrative that we have to acknowledge and then manage, and that is Amy Bilal, after five attempted suicides, an incredible international leadership in creating the spaces and the language and the words to explore mental health concerns. She, of course, committed suicide on March 23, 2017. But even this ending, tragic as it is, even this ending is not an ending because Project Semicolon survives. I remain incredibly inspired by this project. And I know there are plenty of us, plenty of you watching this video today, but plenty of us on this planet. We know the courage that has to be summoned when you make a decision to live one more day. When you make a decision to just try and take one more breath when you make a decision to, today, try and stand and take a step. And that's why I really want to summon the inspiration of this project to get us moving beyond denial and bullying and self-absorption and jealousy. To recognise that this current moment of your PhD is not an ending, it's not a full stop. It's a comma. It's a comma, and you have control over what happens after that comma. So what we're going to do following this comma vlog is in that 10 vlogs in what I've called the comma series. And look, it may end up a book for me. I do not know where this is going. I'm summoning this out there and we're gonna have a go at doing this. But each of these 10 vlogs is going to take a moment in a PhD journey that could have been the end. And we're gonna talk about it and we're gonna provide strategies out of it. And the 10 are, and I have probably predicted what I think they will be. I've done a bit of research on the 10 and I think this will work. Fear, self-absorption, disappointment, blame, shame, denial, jealousy, <laughs> bullying, anxiety, and we finish off with, my personal favorite, chaos. Now, interestingly, a lot of these topics were requested of me after our gas, gas lighting vlog. So that was quite a biggie and confronted a lot of people. Now, after the gas lighting vlog, I received a lot of requests, particularly around two topics, narcissism <laughs> and jealousy. So we'll be handling that and a lot more. But the goal of this series is not actually to talk about those other people. So those other people over there are narcissistic. Those other people over there, they lie. They lie. I'm not interested in those other people over there. I'm interested in you. Let's look at you. Yeah? You. 
Look at how you summon words in the world. Look how you summon behaviours in the world. How are you managing your personal behaviour? How are you managing your relationship with your peers, your colleagues, your friends, your supervisor, your parents, your kids? Are you a source of hope and positivity and energy? Or do you displace, attack, demean and deny? No one can make judgments about yourself except you. So we're going to move through each of these 10 states of being and explore what they are, why they exist, their role and place, the rationale for them in a PhD program, but then, comma, how you manage and transcend them. So we're going to summon all sorts of results and show how blame, denial, jealousy, all the 10 are actually a comma. And they are a comma that moves you to your next stage in professional development. So therefore, let's talk about the comma. There are, at its most basic, four different types of comma. The listing comma, the joining comma, the gapping comma, the bracketing comma. So the listing comma is the one we most frequently use. So that's the one comma that you could take the comma out and replace it with and or or. So apples and oranges and bananas. The joining comma must be followed by an and or but yet so. Yet comma. Right. The gapping comma, which is really rare but was quite common in the 19th century, indicates that a few words in the sentence are not being repeated and will put a comma to stand for those words. So the best example I can probably give you is like the sentence, uh, the, the PhD is the highest qualification and the associate certificate, comma, the lowest. The bracketing comma, which is the one I use the most, always exists in a pair, like a pair of budgies, a pair. And what the bracketing commas do is that they present an, a significant phrase in a sentence, but that bracketing phrase could be removed and the sentence still makes sense. So, yep, all good commas, right. But, of course, there's another definition of a comma that exists outside of grammar and outside of linguistics. And it's often forgotten. And this very special and important comma comes from computer science. So in computer science languages, the if statement is incredibly important and it is followed by, you've guessed it, a comma. So in computer science, if a particular condition is met, then a particular action is chosen. So the if in computer science is followed by a comma and signals bifurcation. Bifurcation. So the comma is the moment that a choice emerges and a pathway is chosen. So through this series, we're going to take the full stop words. Blame, fear, denial, je jealousy, shame, and move beyond the full stop and create a comma. And in that way, we summon a choice. We summon a pathway. So if you are remaining stuck in these words and in these states, so that they are becoming in your own life a full stop rather than a comma, particularly in a time like this, but also in life, all of us have to manage death and job insecurity and the loss of a house and a divorce and all sorts of stuff. Now, if you get lost in those states and they become a full stop, then you are not going to finish your PhD. You're just not. You're going to remain lost in blame and denial and self-absorption and disappointment. But if these states can become a comma, a moment of pause, a moment of reflection, a signal of bifurcation is imminent. And when you have a comma, and an alternative, a pathway, will appear. If you can do that, then you will survive. 
you will thrive. In a difficult period like this one, you will do well. You will be successful in a tough, strange world. And I wanted to finish this odd vlog. We've never done a vlog like this, but let's finish this odd vlog with something even stranger because this really is our gateway video. And I wanted to finish this with a final node of wisdom, also involving a productive use of a comma and a productive use of an if. <laughs> but this ending also invokes, summons, uncomfortable knowledge. And that's part of the meta point that I'm making today. Through this series, we're all going to have to sit in discomfort. And remember, our whole culture is geared around making us feel comfortable, satiated. So I'm going to ask that we sit in discomfort for the next little bit, that we listen to our words, the commentary, the advice, who we are in the world, and we think about what we don't want to think about. To look with coldness and boldness and clarity at your weaknesses, flaws and errors and not shirk away from your responsibility, my responsibility, our responsibility for improvement. And that we stop, stop displacing our issues onto others. To believe in the comma, to believe in the next step and not sit in the full stop of your creation. So let's get uncomfortable <laughs> in these final couple of minutes. And look, I'm gonna summon a knowledge system that's hyper-colonial. <laughs> this knowledge system was used to justify the brilliance, the beauty and the righteousness of British colonization. And I also note Edward Said's amazing post-colonial revisioning of this remarkable writer. And look, I'm going to summon a knowledge system that's patriarchal, capital P, where women are not even people. <laughs> They're not even available for consideration in this knowledge system. And I'm summoning a knowledge system that was written in 1895 and used <laughs> for nearly a century to inspire and instruct upper class English public school boys and of course in the Australian system private school boys and it was a way to instruct these affluent young men into a life of leadership and power. So everything is wrong with this knowledge system but I bring it to you today noting the race class gender issues and ask as we move into our comma series that you find some peace, some courage and some hope here. So what is this knowledge system that was used to teach posh young Englishmen to rule the world? <sighs> Rodyard Kipling's If. If you can keep your head about you when all are losing theirs and blaming you, if you can Trust yourself when all men doubt you, but make allowances for their doubting too. If you can wait and not be tired of waiting or being lied about, don't deal in lies. Or being hated, don't give way to hating. And yet, don't look too good or talk too wise. <laughs> If you can dream and not make dreams your master. If you can think and not make thoughts your aim. Oh, I love this bit. If you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two imposters just the same. If you can bear to hear the truths you've spoken twisted by knaves to make a trap for fools. Or watch 
the things you gave your life to broken and stoop and build them up with worn out tools. If you can make one heap of all your winnings and risk it on one turn of pitch and toss and lose <laughs> and start again at the beginning and never breathe a word about the loss. If you can force your heart and nerve and sinew to serve your turn long after they're gone. And so hold on when there is nothing in you except the will which says, hold on. If you can talk with crowds and keep your virtue or walk with kings and not lose the common touch. If neither foes nor loving friends can hurt you. If all men count with you, but none too much. If you can fill the unforgiving minute with 60 seconds worth of a run, yours is the earth and everything in it. And which is more, you'll be a man, my son. Now this poem was used to send young men to their deaths in war, to send generations of young men to serve the British Empire and become captains of industry. But the use of the computer science if and the comma, quite meaningful. And probably that poem is the most instructive introduction I can give you for what we're going to do in the next few weeks. If you have courage to fill your time with opportunity, if you can look at your life with hope and promise, if you can confront despair and know that it is transitory, if you can lose only to know that if you try again, you'll win. Yours is the PhD and everything in it and which is more, you'll be a scholar, my friend. I wish you love, light and peace. Tea out.